start with some history of the electronics industry, some fun facts that I think you'll find very interesting. In 1943, a gentleman said, I'm sure he was a gentleman, he said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. And you might be really surprised to learn that this gentleman was Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM. Now, if his prediction had, been, had come true, I would have cornered the world market of computers in my basement probably 10 years ago. So you can see this is sort of a hint of how the electronics industry has developed, that it's been a surprise even to the leaders of the industry. In 1946, early electronic computers used glass valves. They're called vacuum tubes. And if you are an audiophile and have like a guitar amplifier, um, you'll see these vacuum tubes the, uh, that are stuck in the back of that. They kind of glow. Um, what's very interesting is one of the first electronic computers was called ENIAC. It had 18,000 valves, which uh, sucked up enough power to light 10 homes, and it weighed 30 tons. So imagine today, you know, when you've got a small computer now that you feel like it weighs 30 tons, it really doesn't. But uh, the first computers were in the, in the tons. And what was really interesting too, these vacuum tubes looked like light bulbs, and they would glow and get warm, and so they attracted moths. And moths would get inside these computers and cause them to fail, and that's where the term debugging came from. So some of these facts are going to be very, very helpful to you because I was told that this question about debugging and vacuum tubes was actually the winning question in who wants to be a millionaire. So this stuff really does pay off. In 1947, the first transistor, and I'm going to show you some transistors later in this series, the first transistor was developed at Bell Labs by three gentlemen, Bardeen, Britton, and Shockley. Early transistors in uh, the mid-1940s cost between $5 and $45 each. And contrast that to today, the resistors and transistors that I'm going to show you later, 15 cents each, maybe less. So now you're getting a little clue about how crazy upside down this industry is that the more we work and the more advanced we get, the cheaper things are. In 1949, this is great, there was a quote in Popular Mechanics magazine where they were forecasting the relentless march of science. I always like saying that, the relentless march of science. And they said computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. Now imagine your latest laptop or your tablet that now we're talking about six ounces for a, a, a tablet computer that can do obviously tons more than, than these ancient computers could. In 1954, the first fully transistorized computer was invented. Um, it was developed by IBM and it had 2,000 separate transistors. Now keep that in mind, 2,000 transistors back in 1954 because now you're going to see how we've progressed over these years. In 1958, the first integrated circuit, also called IC, was um, invented, largely attributed to Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments. And you know, this is kind of special to me because TI, Texas Instruments, was where I got my first job out of college. And that's where the first transistor was invented, or the first integrated circuit was invented. Uh, it's a little special thing for me. Yes, I'm a geek, okay, I admit it. I, I think this stuff is really cool. All right, m uh, moving on. In 1971, the first microprocessor was invented by Intel. And Intel, as you all know, the Intel Inside logo, fuels the heart of many um, of the computers that we use today. The first computer, the first microprocessor that Intel invented had 2,300 integrated transistors. So back then that was a huge number, but today it's, it's actually minuscule compared to what we can do. In 1975, this was a very important concept that was developed. Um, chip complexity, which is how, con um, how much stuff you can shove into a, a single computer chip, it was predicted that it would double every one and a half years. This is what we call in our industry Moore's Law. Um, Gordon Moore, who was one of the um, founders of Intel, his original prediction in 1965 said that chip complexity was going to double every year. Um, in 1975, so 10 years after when he looked back and said, what have we done over the last decade? He refined his, his law to say every two years. So our industry decided, well, what the heck, let's just split the difference and define what we call Moore's Law, that every year and a half, chips are going to get double um, in complexity. Twice as much stuff, do twice as much, and uh, 
to this day in 2000, oh gosh, we're in 2012. 2012, Moore's Law continues to um, kind of rule the industry. In 1977, this quote, which is um, a little bit disturbing in a way, um, and, I'll, and you'll be surprised at who said this, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. And we say that, we see that today and say, what, what, what on earth is happening? The gentleman who said this was Ken Olson, president, chairman, and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation. And the reason this is disturbing is when you have someone who is leading one of the premier computer companies at the time say no one is going to want a computer in their home, they completely missed where the world was going to go. And um, if, if you have any history of digital equipment, they eventually became acquired by Compaq Computer, which became acquired by HP, and um, digital equipment is no more. So this type of vision is so crucial to our industry that the leaders say, where are we really going to be? so that they can position the company and they can position the technology to be where the people want to be in the future. Uh, kind of a funny story, my husband worked for digital equipment and then Compaq and then HP, three jobs, three companies, he never had to leave his desk. Um, acquisitions are, are very important and sort of part of life in, in our uh, fast-paced industry. All right, in 1983, Apple introduced the first user-friendly computer. And if you guys are my age, you'll know that she was named Lisa. And Lisa weighed 52 pounds, and she cost $10,000. But this is the entry into the actual portable computer age. And um, as you know, Apple has continued to bring some pretty amazing products to the market. In 1998, the Intel Pentium 2 processor was invented, again by Intel, and now it had 7.3 million transistors. So we've gone in a short period of time from 2,000 transistors up to 7 million transistors. In 1998, uh, excuse me, uh, yes, oh, same year, same year. I, see, I'm human, so I can make a mistake, and I can go on YouTube, and that's cool. <laughs> um, in, also in 1998, a very, very important person, to me anyway, said customers need to be 10 times more productive every six years. And this is in line with Moore's Law. So when you can put more stuff in a computer chip every year and a half, you're going to have to be able to figure out how to connect all the little parts and put it all in there. Uh, the gentleman who said this is Art DeGius, who is uh, the CEO of Synopsys. And so uh, this was sort of supporting Moore's Law. It's become a um, mantra of the EDA industry, 10x every six years. Uh, it's kind of funny, one uh, EDA company several years ago said, well, we're kind of cool, so we're going to say we can do 10x every five years. But that tagline only lasted a year or so. Um, marketing technology changes too. So I just had to say that. All right, and finally, oh, I'm sorry. Finally, the very last uh, point on this history that I found fascinating was in 2011, um, Intel again introduced what they call the 10-core Xeon Westmere FX processor. It's, it's, that's a mouthful. And it's also an amazing piece of, of uh, technology because this particular microprocessor has 2 billion, 600 million transistors in something the size of your fingernail. So again, Moore's Law, technology, electronics marching on and on and on. Now, here's one other story I want to tell you. This is really interesting. This is a picture that was in 1954, again, Popular Mechanics Magazine. They ran this picture with the caption below, and I'll, re I'll read you that caption. Um, this is speculating what the home computer was going to look like 50 years later in the year 2004. So the caption says, scientists from the Rand Corporation have created this model to illustrate how a home computer could look like in the year 2004. However, the needed technology will not be economically feasible for the average home. Also, the scientists readily admit that the computer will require not yet invented technology to actually work. But 50 years from now, scientific progress is expected to solve these problems with teletype interface and the Fortran language, the computer will be easy to use. Does this look like our home computer? I don't think so. And the fact of the matter is, this whole thing was a hoax. So in December, on December 9th, 2004, this, uh, there was a popular mechanics article, and you can Google this if you want to read more of the history. 
that said a manipulated, this was for a photo contest, by the way, that they ran. So a manipulated photo of a mock submarine console um, passed off as a 1950s projection of the 2004 home computer. Uh, was, was created by this gentleman named Trolls Eklund Anderson, and he was a sales and tech support technician for a Danish hardware and software distributor. Um, so he originally entered this image in an online photo manipulation contest, and he took this photograph of a mock submarine maneuvering room, and he threw in the, um, the TV and the 1970s teletype and a whole bunch of junk, and he put this fake caption together. And he said, I wasn't intending to create a believable fake. But once this was circulated outside of the contest, it started looking like real news to people. Um, and I have to tell this story with all due respect and my apologies to Sun Microsystems Chief Executive Scott McNeely. But he actually used this in a keynote speech at his Oracle Open World um, event. And um, that was in 2004. Uh, to illustrate how rapidly technology improves. So, you know, if this is stuff like this is good enough to fool Scott McNeely, well, I guess it's good enough to fool you and me. But the, t the, the lesson to take away from this is that you cannot believe everything you see on the internet. And perhaps that even includes some of the stuff you're gonna see in this video series.